Hi, fourth grade, welcome back. Today we are doing lesson two. We are learning about how and why they began traveling on the Oregon Trail today. We know we'll be successful when we can. Explain how the travelers began traveling to Oregon. Explain the brown gold rush and how this impacted their travels. We have already learned about the regular gold rush. The travels of the trail, including the hardships and the daily life of the Oregon Trail travelers. Our vocab words today include landmarks. These are land features that serve as guides to travelers. Remember back then they didn't have maps, phones, or even roads. So using landmarks would have been very important for them on their travels. The next word is missionary. These are people who try to spread their religious beliefs to others. Our next word is manifest destiny. This is belief in the 1800s that America had the right to expand across the continent. And our last word is frontier, a border between a settled area and wild or unknown land. All right, fourth grade, we're going to start over here on chapter three, the trails open. In 1803, the U.S. President Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory from France. The territory covered 828,800 square miles of land. This famous deal, the Louisiana Purchase, doubled the amount of land controlled by the United States. In 1804, Jefferson sent a team headed by Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to explore this territory in neighboring Oregon. Jefferson hoped they would find the Northwest Passage and help America gain more control over Oregon. And up here we have Lewis and Clark were helped by a Shoshone woman guide named um, Sacagawea. The Brown Gold Rush. Now this is different than the gold rush we had previously learned about, so I want you guys to be listening to see the difference of our new gold rush. In 1806, Lewis and Clark returned from their journey. They had not found the Northwest Passage because it didn't exist. But their glowing reports of Oregon's rich soil and rivers filled with beavers soon sent trappers, these are people who caught animals for their furs, rushing west. At the time, Beaver fur was in fashion, and traders could make lots of money selling it. They called the fur brown gold. Here are beaver pelts or skins like these were a common sight at fur trading posts throughout the Northwest in the early 1800s. And you can see an example there. And at one time, a single beaver fur sold for about $30. That was one month's salary for the average worker. So you could see how valuable those furs were. A pass is found. Fur trappers, known as mountain men, became the trail's next great explorers. The trail through the Rocky Mountains was one of the most difficult sections these men faced. In 1812, trapper Robert Stewart found, Stewart found a pass or opening through the Rockies that wagons could cross. However, a war with Great Britain had just broken out, so Americans slowed their travel west. Stewart's route was forgotten for years. Up here, it says mountain men knew the way over rough terrain and through dangerous mountain passes. Wagons start rolling. In 1818, the United States and Great Britain agreed to share control of Oregon. At first, the only way American pioneers could reach Oregon was by ship. They sailed around the southern tip of South America and up the Pacific coast. In 1824, two mountain men, Jedediah Smith and Thomas Fitzpatrick, rediscovered Stewart's route called South Pass. With that, the first pioneer wagons were rolling west along the Oregon Trail by 1832. And so here, South Pass is lo located in what is now Wyoming. And most Americans live so far from the ocean, so a sea voyage to Oregon was not possible. South Pass opened a land route to Oregon. Then they could start that journey. Rock star. Early pioneers didn't have accurate maps, so they often used landmarks. That was our vocab word there to guide them. The trail's most famous landmark was Chimney Rock in western Nebraska. It was a huge reddish rock topped with a stone chimney that reached more than 300 feet high. Chimney Rock marked the end of the prairie and the beginning of the slow, steady climb toward the Rocky Mountains. And Chimney Rock could be seen from 40 miles away. Chapter 4, Hopes and Dreams The first settlers to take wagons to Oregon were missionaries. Remember, those are people who went over to spread the word of their religion. They went there to convert Native Americans to Christianity. In 1836, missionaries Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spaulding became the first pioneer women to cross the Rocky Mountains with their husband. They proved that women as well as men could survive on the trail. 
families back east believed that they could too, that they too could handle the journey. And here's Narcissa Whitman. She became a missionary at age 16. And Narcissa Whitman here with her husband and daughter nurses a sick Native American man back to health. Oregon fever. In the 1840s, wonderful descriptions of Oregon written by missionaries and mountain men began to appear in newspapers and books. Many Americans dreamed of starting farms and businesses in Oregon. Others talked of moving to Oregon to drive out the British. These people believed that America had the right from, to expand from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. This belief was known as Manifest Destiny, our other vocabulary word. This booklet was written to encourage people to come to Oregon. It describes the land of the Oregon Territory and what life was like for settlers. So they're writing these booklets saying, come to Oregon. It's beautiful. We want you guys here um, for lots of different reasons. Searching for gold. In 1846, journalist Horace Greeley urged adventurous men to follow their dreams to the new frontier. Go west, young man. Go west, he wrote. By the 1850s, tens of thousands of Americans had done just that. Traffic along the Oregon Trail had increased. Gold had been discovered in California in 1848. That's what we learned about. Thousands of travelers were following the trail's southern branch to the California gold fields. And here it says, the California gold rush caused people to need lumber and other items. In 1850, Oregon became a source for these things, and people who sold with the my and people who sold what the miners needed became wealthy. So you can see how all of these traveling West items started to merge together. People are trying to go to Oregon. People went to California for the gold rush. Um, all of them traveling West. The man who saved the trail. Ezra Meeker, Meeker first journeyed to Oregon in 1852. Later in life, he worried that Americans had forgotten the Oregon Trail. So in 1906, at the age of 76, he decided to take his journey again in an ox-drawn covered wagon, this time going east. Along the way, Meeker urged people to save the trail. His efforts led directly to the trail's protection by the U.S. government. And in 1924, at the age of 94, Meeker flew over the trail by airplane from Washington State to Ohio. So here you can see his trail route. And here's Kansas. So a lot of people traveled through Kansas on their journey as they were going west, which also helped people lead them to Kansas in general. A long walk. Life on the trail was hard. Wagons weren't large enough to store all the pioneers' belongings. So everyone except for young children, the old, the ill, and pregnant women walked the entire way. This was usually a 2,000-mile journey that took between four and six months. Every evening, wagons had to be unloaded for dinner and sleeping. Every morning, they were reloaded for the day's hike. Up here, it says a fully loaded covered wagon could weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. And the pioneers packed wagons with seed, farming tools, saws, blankets, clothes, lanterns, mirrors, paper, pens, and medicine. Anything they might need to survive on that long trail. So food and different pieces as much as they could, um, but you have to be also be ready to start your new life to wherever you're moving. Home sweet wagon. The typical wagon was narrow, so it would fit between the rock walls of mountain passes. Wagons were also sturdy enough to take the bumpy ride. They had wooden wheels wrapped with iron bands, a handbrake, and a canvas cover for protection from rain and dust. Wagons were pulled by teams of oxen or mules, and families slept in their wagons or in tents. So you can see here a picture of the wagon. So that's why they might be unloading it every night um, so that they're able to sleep in the wagon themselves. The daily routine, pioneers awoke at sunrise. They gave their animals food and water, repaired the wagons and ate breakfasts of coffee, bacon and dry bread. Then they walked the trail with a short break for lunch. Just before sundown, they set up camp. In the evening, parents taught their children, and many pioneers joined in singing, dancing, and storytelling around the campfire. So they spent most of their day walking. Can you imagine if that's how you spent your day? It was just walking miles and miles. Sights on the trail. Travelers observed many strange and wonderful things on the trail. They saw wildflowers blooming, bison roaming, and prairie dogs popping out of holes in the ground. But travelers also passed sad sights, just as the graves of pioneers who had died. 
The trail was also littered with personal belongings that pioneers were forced to leave behind to lighten their wagons. Bison were known as king of the plains. With few trees on the trail, pioneers often burned bison droppings called buffalo chips in place of firewood. All right, your journal question today is, would you have traveled on the Oregon Trail? Make sure to tell me why or why not, or tell your teacher. And fourth grade, I can't wait to continue this journey west with you. Great job today. Thank you.